You may be seated. All right. The Torah portion today is Ki Tetse. And what does that mean? When you go to war, it's time to go to war. And I think that's very apropos for the times that we live in. But what's amazing is there are many levels to a lot of different things. And it so happens this Torah portion has more commandments in it than any other Torah portion. This is the big one with all kinds of commandments. Before I jump into that, I've added two verses to your notes. You can just reference them. It's from Luke 10. You can just pin that in. I just added them this morning. It says in Luke 10, 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted the Messiah saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, now let me ask you something. Here's a lawyer. What do you think of lawyers? I mean, I love good, I love good lawyers. I love honest lawyers. But then you have some of uh, these defense attorneys that defend the most horrible and try to get them off the hook. Okay, matter of fact, I've got a lawyer joke. But it's just a joke for all you nice lawyers. Uh, what's the difference between a catfish and a lawyer? One is a scum-sucking bottom dweller and the other is a fish. <laughs> ah. Okay, aside from that, I do love lawyers. But oh, I wanted to point this out that Yeshua is being confronted by a lawyer. Now, a lawyer is concerned about the laws. So this is a guy that thinks he knows Torah in and out, and he's trying to put Yeshua on trial and see how smart he is. He's supposed to be this really smarty pants lawyer. And he asked this question to test him. And now Yeshua answered correctly. And so now he's trying to justify himself. And so in Luke 10, 29, it says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Yeshua, okay, well, who's my neighbor? Now, doesn't that sound like a lawyer? Who is my neighbor? Okay, now I have to love my neighbor as myself. Okay, that's the law, but who's my neighbor? As you know, they're, they're very good. Lawyers are good. They look at the details and they always try to find out how they can skirt the law or see if Yeshua tries to skirt the law. So I want you to understand when you read this, this is a lawyer who supposedly knows it, and now he's trying to justify himself. Okay, so with that said, let's look at Deuteronomy 21.10. Here it is, when you go to war against your enemy. Now, most lawyers, if you think like a lawyer, say, okay, how do you define enemy? You know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. They like to you know, let's get down to the brass tacks. Who is my enemy, right? Well, look at the very next verses. If any man have two wives, talk about going to war. <laughs> I mean, I think it's interesting. This brings about if anybody goes to war and you have two wives. Okay, so there's a lot of definitions of war as well. <clears throat> and he says, if one is beloved and another one is hated... Well, wouldn't she be my enemy if that's the case? And they both have borne him kids, the beloved one and the hated one. And if the firstborn be of hers that was hated, it'll be what he makes his sons to inherit what he has. He may not make the son of the beloved firstborn be before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he has to acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. Now, can anyone remember any incident that this might apply to? Jacob and Esau. Now, that happened about 400 years before this. Okay, and back then there was no law. And so it's interesting that in this Torah portion, one of the first things they talk about is Leah and Rachel. And who's my neighbor? Who's my brother? Okay. Now, 
Look at Deuteronomy 22, 1 through 3. You shall not see your brother's ox. Ooh, okay, that only applies to my brother's ox, not my enemy's ox. I just want you to understand what real legalism is. A lot of people say, oh, the Torah is all about legalism. No, it's not. It's the legalists who make it legalism. Are you following me? Okay, you see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray, because they're going to be wondering, who's my brother? And then you hide yourself. Wow, you shall in any case bring them again to your brother. So if you see one of your brother's possessions wandering off, don't just go tell him, and by then no one can find him. Go grab him and then take him back to your brother. And now look at this. How do you define brother? Well, look here. And if your brother is not near you, or if you don't know him. Okay, well, now wait a minute. Now this is telling you it's not just a brother as we think. This is a brother who you don't even know. So now let's look at this. And it says, you have to bring it to your house. Let's say the brother lives a couple of miles away. How many of you hear of these stories of dogs that run off and then they're found states away or whatever? Okay, well, if you find this dog, you're supposed to keep the dog or whatever until someone comes to get it, right? But wait, there's more. It says, <clears throat> then... You will bring it to your own house and it'll be with you until your brother comes after it. And then you have to give it back to him again. Wow. Let's say someone lost a dog and you've taken care of it for three years and you love that dog and you consider that your dog. And now someone comes and they have a chip in it. They know it's theirs. Are you going to, you know, what are we supposed to do? And then it says, in like manner, you're to do with his donkey, and so shall you do with his clothing and with all lost things of your brothers, which he has lost and you have found. So you do likewise. You may not hide yourself. Okay, <clears throat> so here we have a Torah command concerning lost and found. If someone lost something and you found it, what are you supposed to do with it? How many of you hear of a Brinks armored truck falling, rolling over, and millions of dollars are scattered all over the highway? And everybody runs to grab it, and do they turn, return it? It's, I'm out of here. But this is telling us, it's not yours. Someone else lost it, and what you're supposed to do is return and don't hide yourself. Okay, now let me ask you something. Uh, uh, you know, someone might say, now here's what the legalistic person would say. Here's what the lawyer would say. I'm not under the law. It doesn't say his horse. So if he loses his horse, I can keep that. It only says his donkey. Are you following me? That is what legalism is. What does the heart say? Oh my goodness, the Father wants us to return things that don't belong to us. We can't steal. Doesn't that make sense? And so how do we go and say, well, all of this is done away with? I don't think so. But look at this. In Exodus 23, 5, if you see the donkey of the one who what? Hate you. I don't care if it's your brother, if it's your neighbor. You see someone who absolutely, now you may not hate him, but they hate you. Lying under his burden and you don't want to help him, you shall what? Surely help him. It's not you, sh you, sh you know, should help him. It's you better help him. You surely shall help him. So here is your neighbor's donkey in this picture. And he's under this horrible burden. And you hate this guy. The Bible says, I don't care if you hate that guy. You have to help the donkey. You follow me? The, even if the person hates you. Now, let me ask you this. Where in the Ten Commandments is you have to help someone who hates you? So the Christian will say, well, I don't have to do that. 
Uh, I'm not under the law. It's done away with. And the, the Ten Commandments is all I have to keep. And that's not in the Ten Commandments. Now, isn't that ridiculous? This is why you can't say the Torah's done away with because there's so much in here talking about how we are to behave. Now, look at Deuteronomy 22.4. Now, this is not someone who hates you, but this is your brother's donkey or ox that's also fallen down by the way and hide yourself from them. He says, no, you shall surely help him to lift them up again. So what is the Bible telling us? It doesn't matter if it's friend or foe. We have to help them in time of need. So with these commandments, what is God trying to tell us about himself? Help the helpless. Regardless, our, God wants us to help the helpless. Look at Deuteronomy 22, verse 6 and 7. Okay, I've got a little nest of eggs here. And there's ground nesting birds as well as tree nesting birds. And it says, if a bird's nest happens to be before you in the way, in a tree or on the ground, whether there be young ones or just eggs, and mama is sitting on the young or on the eggs, don't take the mama with the babies, but you shall in any way let the mama go and then take the eggs or the young to you that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. Do you realize there is nothing more helpless than an egg? <laughs> nothing more helpless than a mama bird on the eggs. And God is concerned about the least of every, a little, we might say, I mean, I know people who like to drive over cats. They like to drive over dogs. You know what I'm talking about. There are people that are just cruel and here God says, I am the kind of God who is even concerned about the little birds. And so I want you to be concerned about the little birds and their eggs. And look what happens. You know, they talk about, wow, I want to live a lot longer. Where is the secret to long life? Take care of the helpless. God needs more of those type around. He wants to wipe out the wicked. He needs a lot more people that are kind and gentle and take care of the infirmed. Not just the humans, but even the littlest. So what this is teaching is don't be cruel to the mother. All right? It's just like I've got here the mama and the little birds, like the, the hen wanting to take care of its chicks. Well, here's the thing. Don't use her instincts against her as a trap. You want the mama, so you go to the bird. They be birds and the mama comes to protect the birds. And it says, this verse instructs one to chase the mother hen away from its nest before you take its fledglings. Now, let's look. Can, I want you to realize you don't want to look at things at a surface level. We always want to dig and go deeper, just like the ocean is compared to the word of God, right? You can either stick your toes in it while you're on the beach. You can go swimming in it. You can get in a boat, you can go snorkeling, you can go scuba diving, okay? You can get in a submarine. The whole question is, what is our relationship to the Word of God? How deep do we want to go? On a deeper level, listen to this, this law actually reflects the state of the Jewish people who are in exile, the mother bird who's been chased away, which refers to the Shekinah, God, who has up and left the temple when it was about to be destroyed, it says uh, the mother bird who's been chased away cries about the separation from her children. When her cries were heard on high, the angels said to the Lord, why he has commanded that the mother bird suffer such a sad fate. And God answers that it is because he shares the same fate as the mother bird, as his presence has been driven from the holy temple. His children have been taken into exile. And God asks that the angels sympathize with his plight and the plight of the Jewish people. He demands that they pray for the return of the Jewish people to their homeland for the restoration of the temple so that once again, his presence will be able to dwell with his people. Now watch. In Luke 13, 34, and 35, 
Yeshua says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, stone those who are sent to you. How often I've wanted to gather your children together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you refused. Your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you won't see me again until you say, Baruch, Kabab, Bashem, Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But so when we look at the Torah from deeper levels, you can see God is the mother hen who goes away. And then the Jews are taken in exile, but the mother hen wants the kids back. And it is our job, it says in Isaiah, to return them back, which is why I'm going to this meeting this weekend. It's all about not creating a two-state solution. It will be, I mean, I can't think of anything worse judgment coming on America than if we stick with this two-state solution that we're doing. Okay, uh, look at Deuteronomy 23, uh, verse 7, uh, no, verse 8, 22, I mean, 22, verse 8. And I have a little picture of a new house. It says, when you build a new house, you shall make a battlement for your roof that you bring not blood on your house if any man fall from there. And so this is a, a command that build the perimeter around the roof of your house if you got a flat house so someone walking along or a kid doesn't fall off. Now, is that one of the Ten Commandments? No, but I still think it's a pretty good idea. Okay, let's get the next one. Deuteronomy 23, 7 and 8. If there's anyone they hate, it's the Edomites. And it says, look at this. You are not to hate an Edomite because he's your what? Jacob and Esau were brothers. And Esau wants to kill Jacob. But God says you can't abhor him because he's your brother. And it says you're not to abhor an Egyptian for heaven's sake. Because you are a stranger in their land, and the children that are begotten of them will enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. Wow. Now again, who's my brother? Look at Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. Whenever you vow a vow to the Lord your God, you know, you better pay it on time. For the Lord your God is going to require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you don't vow, it's not a sin. Then it says, whatever's gone out of your lips, you better keep it and perform it, even if it's a free will offering. All right? You have to do what you promised with your mouth. Now, look at Deuteronomy 23, 24 and 25. Here I got a vineyard, a little picture of a vineyard. And it says, when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat grapes at your fill, at your own pleasure, but you can't put any in a vessel. Okay, and when you come into the standing corn or weed or whatever grain of your neighbor, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you will not move a sickle to your neighbor's standing corn. Okay, this is, uh, someone even asked me the other day, and there's more than one verse about, was it okay for Yeshua when his disciples were picking ears? Right here tells you they can't. The thing is, by stealing from your neighbor is when you put a whole bunch in your pockets, a whole bunch in your bucket, and you take it home. All right? God says all the commandments are that you may live. And there's nothing wrong if you're going through a field. Hey, put some grapes in your hands. That's it. In your hands, in your mouth. Now, look at Matthew uh, 12, verse 1 and 2. At that time, Yeshua went on the Sabbath day through the grain fields. His disciples were hungry. They began to pluck the head, the grain, and to eat. But the Pharisees, when they saw it, behold, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Well, guess what? It just got done saying it was lawful, and nowhere did it mention you can't do it on the Sabbath. They're, they're making these things up according to their own man-made laws, not God's laws. All right, look at Deuteronomy 24.9. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam after you had come out of Egypt. Does anyone remember what God did to Miriam? And why did she get the leprosy? Evil speech. Evil speech. Wow. Proverbs 18, 21 says death and life are in the tongue and they that love it will eat the fruit. So if you love death, you get to eat that. If you love life, you get to eat that. It's wow. I mean, it's what we speak is so important. 
Matter of fact, look at Proverbs 15, 2 through 4. It says, the tongue of the wise use knowledge rightly, but the mouth of the fool pours out foolishness. Here it is. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the evil and the good, and a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Wow, we want to look for the eternal youth? Start doing what the Bible says. You'll have long life. Take care of the little birds. Honor your father and mother. Uh, you know, make your tongue be a tree of life. Okay, here you go. Look at Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 and 15. You're not to oppress a hired servant that's poor and needy. Whether he is one of your brothers or a stranger that is in your land within your gates. And then it says, you have to pay him on payday. Okay, that's what it's saying here. At his day, you shall give him his hire. Don't let the sun go down on it because he's poor and he has set his heart on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and it be a sin to you. So what is this saying? Employers have to pay their employees on payday. Right? So how would you like to have your employer say, I'm not under the law. I don't have to pay you on payday. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. Again, this is why it's so stupid to throw out the Torah. Well, then the employer can say, I don't have to pay you. I'm not under the law. Dumb, dumb, dumb. And how many of you know this is not one of the big ten? That the employer have to pay you on payday is not one of the big ten. This is why you don't throw these away. <clears throat> Look at Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. When you're cutting down the harvest in your field and you forgot a sheaf, don't go back again and get it. Let it be for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. And when you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the bows again. It's for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, don't glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and you will remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Okay, wow. There's a lot of ways we can look at this. We can be legalistic and we can say, well, good thing I don't have to take care of the stranger, fatherless, and widow because I'm not a farmer. <laughs> this is only a place for farmers. That's legalism. Do you see where this whole idea of Torah being legalism is so stupid? What is this telling us about God? Take care again of the helpless, the fatherless, the widow, the stranger. That is what God, God's laws are given so we can look at them and understand his nature and character. That's the purposes of the laws. If you throw out all the laws, then you, you don't know who God is. You have this imaginary concept of who God is. Look at Deuteronomy 25.4. You shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain. Okay, now when you hear, you shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain. Why? Why? Why does it say that? What, what's the goal of this? Hey! You're working that ox to death. Let him eat to survive and he'll last a lot longer on your farm. Okay. The legalist will say, okay, I can muzzle my horse. I can muzzle all the other animals. I can't muzzle the ox though. Again, that is what legalism is. Now here's a point I have to bring up. And you have to realize you are free to do this when you study your Bible. This is very important. This is a Hebrew word called pardes. It's kind of like it means garden. But it's an acronym for something I want you to remember. The letter P stands for the Peshat, which is the plain meaning of the text. The plain meaning of the text here is don't muzzle the ox. Right? He's working hard for you. Let him eat. Then the R stands for a remez, which means a hint. God may be hinting at something else this may apply to. Then there is a drash, which means an allegory. Okay, if you remember the New Testament, they use this concept all the time. Remember, 
well, Hagar is Mount Sinai and, and Sarah is Jerusalem on high. They use allegories all the time. You can do that with scripture. Then the S stands for sowed, which means something that's hidden that you don't see. At Proverbs 25, it's the honor of the Lord to hide something and it's the honor of kings to search it out. There's a lot of hidden things in scripture, but the most important thing you have to understand the sowed, the allegory, the remez never replaces the main meaning of the text. You can't find another meaning and say, therefore, the plain meaning is done away with. Let me give you some examples. Look at 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. The apostle Paul says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain and the laborers worthy of his reward. Wow. Paul is using a law in the Torah about not muzzling the ox, saying it's okay to pay the person. He's using the very same verse. Okay, that's a remez. That's a hint at another meaning. And it's okay to do that as we see right here. Now, someone say, well, we're not under the law. And so therefore, muzzling the ox is now done away with. We can muzzle the ox, but we got to pay the preacher. I mean, the whole thing is stupid. Stupid. What you have to do is look at the whole picture and see what God is trying to say. And that's exactly what they did in the New Testament. Now, look at Deuteronomy 25, verse 15 and 16. You have to have a perfect and a just weight. Wow. In other words, you can't cheat people when you're weighing. They used to always cheat people when it came to uh, finances because they would add a bunch of other stuff rather than copper to the penny, or they would add a bunch of other stuff to the silver. That's how they would cheat people. Well, it says, look at this. So your days will be lengthened. Again, it's a tree of life. If you don't cheat, if you take care of the helpless, if you honor your father and mother, God is telling you how to lengthen your days. It says, for everyone who does such things, all who behave unrighteously, they're an abomination to the Lord your God. So if you're stealing things and you're not using righteous judgment, you're an abomination to the Lord. Wow. Now, here comes this. Now, you know, these, like I said, this particular Torah portion has more commandments in it than any other Torah portion. But how many of these commandments are still a good idea? They're all a good idea. And none of them are in the top 10. But you can't just throw them away. Now, this really applies to today. Uh, all of you should remember, what does the word Amalek mean? B violence. The Hittites or the terrorists. Amalek is, or Hamas is violence. I'm sorry, Hamas. Yes. Hamas is violence. Hamas is violence. Amalek means people who want to chop up body parts. Think about that. Hamas is violence, and Amalek means a people who want to chop up body parts. You know what, you know, was really brought to my mind was you think about what happened October 7th, right? But do you know the spirit of Amalek has always been around? It says God will have war with Amalek how often? Every generation is going to have a war with Amalek. Last century, the biggest war with Amalek was abortion, chopping up body parts. And it's, now we see it directly by Hamas. And here it says, remember what Amalek did to you, by the way, when you came out of Egypt, how he met you, by the way, and he smote the most feeble in the back. All that were feeble. When you were faint and weary, he did not fear God. Therefore, it'll be when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance to possess. I want you to blot out the remembrance of Amalek and don't you forget it. Well, this brings us to the Haftorah portion. And it says, uh, remember, these are all the comforts. Okay, the seven weeks of comfort. It says, sing, O bear run that didn't bear, break forth into singing, Cry aloud, you that didn't travail with child, 
For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch out the curtains of your habitations. Don't spare, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. You're going to break forth on the right hand and on the left, and your seed is going to inherit who? The Gentiles aren't going to inherit Israel. Israel's going to inherit the Gentiles. And then Isaiah 54, verse 5 through 7. Your maker is your husband. When did they get married or espoused? At Sinai, when they received the commandments, that's when the espousal took place. And then it says the Lord of hosts or armies is his name, your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the entire earth shall he be called. For the Lord has called you as a woman forsaken, grieved in spirit, a wife of youth. When you were refused, said your God, but he says, for only a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. Wow, we have a merciful God. Even in the Old Testament, he wasn't mean in the old and now gracious in the new. He's always been just. Now, I love this rainbow here over the Sea of Galilee. And look at Isaiah 54, 8 through 10. It says, in the little wrath, I hid my face from you, but for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And then he says, this is just like the waters of Noah. For as I sworn that the waters of Noah would no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. The mountains may depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness will not depart from you. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Okay, now. We just read in the Torah portion, we have to turn what was lost, right? Guess what? The Jewish people have been lost, and our job is to help them to return to dad. Just like a lost child. And a lot of people go running around trying to help the lost child uh, get home. Okay, so Malachi 3, 7. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone from my ordinances. You've not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of Hosts. Okay, guess what else has been lost that needs to be returned? You. Each and every one of us have gotten lost, and it is our responsibility for each and every one of us to return home. And he says, if we return, just like the prodigal son, he returned, and then his father returned to him. Well, guess what? We are in the month of Elul, which is the month of return. This is why if you understand the times and the seasons, Christians would understand this is the number month, number one month to re- this is the month to return to God. He's in the field. He's listening to you. Now is not the time to not return because guess what's coming? Rosh Hashanah. And look at Matthew 24, 27, 28. Just as lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the carcass is, that's where the eagles will be gathered. And then in verse 7, it says, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. And we see that happening more and more. And then in Matthew 24, 32 through 34, it says, Learn the parable of the fig tree. We know the fig tree is Israel. When its branch is yet tender, puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So likewise, when you see all these things, no that it is near, it's even at the doors, I say to you, this generation won't pass till all these things be fulfilled. Okay, one thing I don't have on this, but I'll just tell you, it's from Psalms 102, and it is one of the most telling verses in the whole Bible that were there. It says, when the Lord will build up Zion, that is when he will appear in his glory. Zion is Jerusalem. Jerusalem got built up in 1967, when Israel captured it. Ever since then, it's been being built up and the whole problem today is all the settlements around Jerusalem as it's being built up. That's the big political problem. But guess what it says then in that Psalm? This is written for the generation to come, which is in Hebrew, acharon, the terminal generation. So the generation that sees Jerusalem being built up is the terminal generation. That's us. 
He's at the door, which is why I'm teaching on the Song of Songs. When he comes at the door and knock, there will be some that don't open immediately. They take their time, and when they open the door, he's already left, and now you get to go through the tribulation. This is why we have to know the times. We have to know the seasons. With that said, let's stand. Avinu Malkenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much. You said in your word, we have to start proclaiming this stuff, and that's why we want to proclaim it from the housetops. We want everyone to know your times and seasons. We want everyone to get on the biblical calendar and the right calendar. We want everyone to have ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to understand that this is it. We are so there. So, Father, as the last hurrah, we want to throw our whole selves into this. Now is the time. There's no other generation that's been closer to your return than ours. And so, Father, now is the time for us to go all in. Father, now is the time for us to invest into people, invest into your kingdom. Even as you said, you want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. Wow, we have the most awesome time of being the generation that can sow into your kingdom and returning your Torah back to where it needs to be and being a light to the nations and not being lawless as the Antichrist is the wicked one, the lawless one, the one without Torah. Father, I thank you for all those that are sowing into your ministry here and being a light to all the nations of the world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay. Are you ready? Is everybody buckled in? Fasten your seatbelts. Okay, I'm going to mention last week, if you remember, we clothed uh, with the Song of Songs, chapter 2 and verse 17, where he is wooing her. She's been fast asleep in the house, okay? And he says, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away for lo, you've been in hibernation. Okay, <laughs> the winter rains are gone, Every, the spring has come, where have you been? And then how she responds with, well, until the day break and the shadows flee away, why don't you go away, my beloved, and be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether or the mountains of separation? So here they are. She's telling him, he's come to the house saying, hey, rise up, come with me. And she says, no, 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 no. I enjoy this beautiful house too much. You go take a hike. All right. Now, I want to jump ahead for a minute. We're going to jump into what's coming in the future because I want to do a comparison for you. Listen to what he says in chapter four about him taking a hike and where he's going. She says, I want to separate it from you. Here, she re he responds in verse six of chapter four, until the day break and the shadows flee away, where I'm going is to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. Well, where is the mountain of myrrh? Where is the mountain of myrrh? It is Mount Moriah. The very word myrrh and Moriah are the same. Myrrh was connected with death, the sacrificial system. Myrrh covered the smell of death right here. Here's a frankincense tree in Oman. And it's the only region in the world where frankincense thrives. They make a lot of money on the sale of frankincense. Here's a picture of a myrrh tree in Ethiopia. And I have the Hebrew word for myrrh. You take those same letters and add the yud hey, which is God's name, and you get Moriah. So the shepherd is saying, I'm going to go die for you. That's where I'm headed. Isn't that mind blowing? That's where he here. The bride tells him to take a hike and he's saying, OK, I'm not going to go separate. I'm going to go die for you. 
Wow. In John 19.39, it says, There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. And what did he bring? A mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. Well, guess what? The sacrifice of Isaac happened on Mount Moriah. The scarlet thread is also connected to the redemption story. It was used in the curtains of the tabernacles, the scarlet thread is, as well as in the priestly garments. The Magi brought the gold and what else? Frankincense and myrrh. Well, let me tell you this, frankincense has earned its title as the king of oils because of its versatility. When used topically, frankincense touts powerful anti-aging properties. It promotes cellular function and the appearance of healthy looking skin, even evening out uh, skin tone and minimizing blemishes and use for healing of wounds. This is why it is whipped on the back and all of that. And concerning myrrh, myrrh is an antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antimicrobial, antiseptic, astringent, decongestant, digestive aid, expectorant, respiratory stimulant, sedative, tonic, and also supports wound healing. And here they're putting this frankincense and myrrh and I think it's interesting that he says, guess where I'm going? I'm going to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. I'm going where I'm going to be beaten and bruised and die. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have here that frankincense and myrrh are both tree resins or a gummy sap that oozes from the bark of two different trees that are native to the Arabian Peninsula and Northeast Africa incisions are made in the bark of the tree during important times of year and so the sap pours out. And I have here that the sacred tea trees that produce frankincense and myrrh are almost impossible to grow outside of the Arabian Peninsula, which meant they were constantly in short supply, high demand. And according to one famous Roman historian, the sap made the Arabians the richest people on earth by Jesus' time. It was even more valuable than gold. Um, so look at Luke uh, 9, 51. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly looked, uh, set his face to Jerusalem. He's saying, look, I know I'm going to die. I'm not wavering. I'm going to the mountain of myrrh. I'm going to the mountain of frankincense. And then what do we see here now in Song of Songs, chapter four, verse seven? He tells her, you are all fair, my love. This is how you know he's speaking. And he says, there is no spot in you. Um, and then what do we see in the Song of Songs, chapter four, verse eight? Come with me from where? She's not even home. <laughs> and what it says, it's like, hey, you're in Lebanon. Come with me my spouse with me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shanir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. How many of you have ever been to Mount Hermon or seen Mount Hermon? Yeah, it's right on the border of Israel and Syria and Lebanon and right up in there. And I think it's fascinating He's saying, come with me from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. When you think of the lion's den, you know, here I have a picture of these lion or this particular lion. And what is he doing? <laughs> He's looking for lunch. He's eyeing everything. And I got this leopard who is on the hunt. He's kind of looking. And here it just talks about the lion's dens and the mountain of leopards. As I said, the book of Hosea ties into the Song of Songs. And look at this in Hosea 1, 2. It says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go and take a wife of whoredoms, the children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom. Why? Because they departed from the Lord. And now let's jump to verse uh, chapter 13. It says, God is speaking and he says, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and then their heart was exalted. This is why they have forgotten me. Remember, we talked about this several weeks before. Now look at this. God says 
Therefore, I'm going to be unto them as a lion and as a leopard. By the way, will I observe them? So the pictures you just saw, the lion and the leopard, is the Lord himself observing the flock of Israel. And he says, look at this. I'm going to meet them as a bear that's been bereaved of her whelps. How many of you want to meet a bear that's upset? Oh, Israel. Uh, oh, then it says, I will be as a bear bereaved of her whelps. I'm going to rend the call of their heart. And look at this. He says, I will devour them like a lion. He is the lion of the king of Judah. He's going to devour Israel, he says. The wild beasts will tear them. And then he says, oh, Israel, you have actually destroyed yourself. But in me is your help. Now look at the very next phrase. What is it? I will be your king, not Solomon. I don't want you to have a human king. I want to be your king. This is the core of God's heart. He says, where is any other that may save you in all your cities? Where are the judges of whom you said, give me a king and a prince? I gave you a king in my anger and I took him away in my wrath. Okay, this is God wants to be Israel's groom, but also their king. Israel, all they want is the benefits. They don't want the relationship. Big difference. And now... The shepherd, though, is speaking. He goes on and he says, you've captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You've captivated my heart with just one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice? Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Okay. So it's like milk and honey. You know, this is great. Honey and milk are under your tongue. But now let's watch what happens. Back in Deuteronomy 31, 20 through 22. God says, I brought them into a land flowing with what? Milk and honey which I swore to give their fathers and they've eaten are full and what they've grown fat. Now they're going to turn to other gods and serve them. They're going to despise me. They're going to break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song will confront them as a witness. It will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do even today before I brought them into the land. I swore to give them. And so Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. This is the song of Moses and Revelation that is going to be sung. It talks about the song of Moses. This is the song. We'll be getting to that here in the next couple of weeks. Now, let's look again at Jeremiah 32, 22 and 23. You gave them this land which you swore to their fathers to give them. It's a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. They entered, they took possession, but they did not obey your voice. They did not walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Therefore, you have made all this disaster come upon them. Now, remember, Jeremiah is a thousand years after Moses. This is a long time. Now, look what he says. See, it's a nice little picture who wants to drink from this water? Ugh. And this is what the bridegroom says to the Shulamite, his bride. He says, you're a garden that is enclosed, my sister, my spouse. You are a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. What happens when something is all sealed? There's no lively flow. And so... Look what he says then. He says, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphire, spike nerd, spike nerd, and saffron, and columbus, and cinnamon, with all the trees of what? Frankincense, myrrh, and alloys, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Okay, well, here's some living water right here. Here's some beautiful living water. Okay. He's saying this is what it's supposed to be like. 
But the problem is, as far as he's concerned, he's, uh, I have here that it looks like building my kingdom is not a priority for you. You want to build your kingdom. But the blessings must flow through you, okay, from you and through you. So look at how the Shulamite responds. Okay, awake, O north wind, and come, you south wind, blow upon my garden. Oops, remember my house, my bed, my before, and then she changes it. Well, now look at this, that the spices thereof may flow out, and then she says, oops, let my beloved come into his garden. It's not my garden, it's his garden, and let him eat his pleasant fruits. Okay, now what's important about that is this, uh, look at chapter five, verse one a. How he responds? He responds with, "Okay, uh, let's take another look here at this." He says, uh, "Guess what? I am come into my garden." Okay, I put a picture of his garden. Okay, he says, "I'm coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine and my milk." Guess who all of it belongs to? Him. We seem to think every time we get blessings, uh, or just like the boy with Israel, here everything was given to them, and they thought it was the power of their own hand, the power of their own wealth. And then they turn from God who gave it. And that's the problem. That's the problem with wealth. It's all about me. And that's, that is not good. Now, here's what is absolutely mind-blowing. Do you remember in the earlier chapters, here he comes. He's been hibernating all winter. And he's just calling out to her, right? And where is she? Well, she wakes up and she hears his voice. So where does she go when she hears his voice? She hides. She runs behind the stairs. Oh my goodness, he's going to call me to go to work. I can't have that. So instead she hides and she tells him to go take a hike. So he does. And then the next day, we saw she woke up in the middle of the night. He's not there. So she goes hunting. The watchman find her and she confesses her love for him. And then all of a sudden he shows up. Okay, so this is the pattern of what's going on. And she keeps falling asleep. So after he says that, look what she says. She says, eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. Okay, but as she says that, she's falling asleep. And what do we see in verse two? I sleep. There it is. But my heart's still beating. Heart, my beloved, what? Knox. You don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew. The word is not rap. It's beating on the door. He is beating on the door trying to get her to get up. Now, I'm going to jump over to this next verse. Let's look at... Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, it's almost like the bridegroom is in overdrive. He's beating on the door, almost like he's doing CPR on her. She's asleep, and he's, he's trying to say, get up, get up. What's fascinating, this is the fall feast where the rain is. In the spring was the spring feast. Now we're in the fall, he returns, and it's the fall feast. He's beating on the door, trying to get her wake up. You know what this tells us? She wasn't eagerly anticipating his return. She wasn't looking out the window. She was asleep. And watch how this unfolds. Now that word knocking on the door if you go to Judges 1922, it talks about people who were enjoying themselves and suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house. And what did they do? That's the same Hebrew word as knock. So I want you to get to understand the Messiah is just beating on the door because she is so sound asleep. Okay, now. Listen to what he says to her. 
He senses you woke up and he goes, open for me. Okay, before he was just speaking. Now he's saying, open that door. My sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. Why? My head is covered with dew and my locks with the drop of the night. Okay, here she is. Home sweet home, sleeping away. He's pounding on the door. Get up, get up. And what does he say? He says, it's the drops of the night. It's, it's a pouring down rain. And he says, it's, my head is covered with dew. Well, I don't know if you knew this. He's not saying he wants to come in because it's raining. He's saying, I want you to come out and enjoy the rain. That's the blessings. If you remember, rain speaks of the blessings. She doesn't want the rain. She doesn't want the blessings. She just wants to stay in the house. And <clears throat> the word for do is the resurrection of the dead. All through the Bible, the word do refers to the resurrection of the dead. He's trying to raise her from her dead sleep. Watch this. I, the dew of heaven always equates to the resurrection of the dead. We find this in Genesis chapter 27, 28. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven. In other words, resurrection from the dead. Look at Isaiah. This is chapter 26, verse 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth will cast out the dead. So wherever you see dew, it always refers to the direction of the dead. It's like she is in a dead sleep, and he's saying, look, if you want to be resurrected, you need to come out of that place and go to work with me. Look at... Ephesians 5, 14, we see a parallel. Therefore, God says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. This is the situation of the body of Messiah. She's asleep and she needs to arise from the dead so they can have the light of what the Messiah wants them to do. As a matter of fact, look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2. He says, my doctrine shall drop as what? The rain. My speech will distill as the dew, as the small rain on the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. When you tie all these verses together, you see exactly what he was talking about. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 12, it says, the Lord will open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto your land in his season and to bless all the work of your hand. The problem is he just wants to stay stole, holed up in the house that he provided her and not help him with his work. The Shulamite response to the shepherd's heart rending appeal after he's brought her back to life has to be one of the most startling verses in the entire Bible. Okay, <clears throat> all of you remember, in Romans, he's telling them it's high time to awake. And in Romans 13, 11, 12, it says, and do this, knowing the time. If we don't know the time, we can't do this. It is now high time to do what? Awake out of sleep. This is a parallel to what we're reading in the Song of Songs. Because our salvation, or Yeshua, is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let's put on the armor of light. Now, one thing that I was going to start with next week, but this is so amazing. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you right now, just as a, a way to be prepared for next week. I, you know, you guys can always read this ahead of time. Yeah, but let me give you this uh, next thing. I've got to open the, okay, here we go. Uh, this is just mind-blowing, okay? 
Oh, here it is. Okay, I want you to listen to this. Here he is. He's outside, and what's going on? It's raining. And he's saying, open the door. Right? Why? Not because he wants in, but because he wants her to come out and enjoy all the blessings. And here's what's how she responds. I've taken off my garment. Do you want me to put it back on? I wash my feet. Do you want me to go out there and get them dirty? And then she goes, oh, my beloved put his hand on the latch. Oh, my heart was thrilled within me. It's all about her. And then she says, well, I got up to open my beloved. Oh, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh. She had to take time to get all gussied up before she opened the door. And then she says, on the handles of the lock, she had the door locked. He couldn't open the door because she had locked it. She had it barred. She's not looking out. She's not trying to go out and help win people to the Messiah. She won't let them come in. She's got the door locked. It's barred and he can't. That's why he's beating on the door. Open the door. So finally it says, I open to my beloved. Notice how she keeps loving him, but won't do anything he says. She says, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. Oh, my soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but I couldn't find him. I called him and he gave no answer. This is what is coming to a church near you. <laughs> there are a lot of places that proclaim they worship God and love God. They don't even know he's left. He's outside the door knocking. Would you come out with me? This is where we're going to pick up next Shabbat. Let's stand.